Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, we're talking about esports in Hawaii. With me is Hawaii State Senator Glenn Wakai. Welcome, Senator. Hi, thank you for having me, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Well, what sparked your interest in esports? Well, when you look at the numbers, they're staggering, right? The last I looked, there were 2.7 billion with a B people on this planet that are doing some type of video gaming. And then you look at the economics of it. And last I saw, it was almost $160 billion worth of action. And I personally am not an esports person, but I am a legislator who looks at opportunities and wants to chase uh, those numbers. And I really appreciate that you have a show like this and I wasn't aware of it, um, that really is the catalyst to helping create the policy that can grow esports. I mean, without discussions like this, it'll be one of those things that people will play in their homes as a hobby and will never actually be able to kind of grow it as a real segment of our economy. And that's kind of where I'd like to take uh, this, this opportunity in the future. Sure. And Senator, as an esports attorney in Hawaii, I'm passionate about bringing it to Hawaii because we, we don't have much going on right now, but it's growing and growing. Uh, what have you noticed about the growth of esports in Hawaii lately? Well, to your point about where are we economically, I mean, we're in the doldrums, right? We're trying to, starting tomorrow, reinvigorate the economy by welcoming back tourists. And as we reframe, what is tourism going to look like in, in the future? Are we going to just go back to what it was before? And I want to look at different opportunities, cultural enrichment, you know, environmental management, and sports is another facet of a growth of opportunity. I mean, we look at Aloha Stadium, then all the things that are going to go on there, I would like to later on in this conversation, have a discussion about what our plans are for esports at Aloha uh, Stadium. But it was really that, that just the staggering numbers and on a more provincial level, at, uh, I represent the area from Kalihi all the way to Aloha Stadium. And Wanalua High School is in my district and Wanalua High School has one of the more prolific esports teams in the state. I think last year or this past year, they battled with Roosevelt and Roosevelt was ultimately the champion for esports here in Hawaii, but it was also that 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 spark of seeing young people in high school uh, doing competitive esports, and I'm working with HHS. That, that group, I can never remember the acronym, but the High School Athletic Association to try and see how we can have esports as a legitimized competitive high school sport uh, as well. So it was um, just the staggering numbers and seeing what Monolo High School was doing in this space that really kind of piqued my interest in looking at the opportunities of esports. So while you were talking, the screen froze a little bit, and that reminds me of one of the issues with esports in Hawaii and that is latency. Um, what are your thoughts about Hawaii being able to have esports and have competitive professional players and events in light of our position in the Central Pacific? Yeah, sorry about that freeze frame there, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we can talk all we want about the opportunities in front of us, but unless we have the firm foundation, which is broadband capacity, our, our discussions are gonna go nowhere. But I'm happy to say that uh, we are at the cusp of bringing in more broadband capacity. Uh, there's a broadband uh, director, I believe he's called, Bert Lum. He's the he's Office of Broadband at DBET, and we're chasing some federal monies to allow for more broadband and fiber drops, uh, state owned on the four most populated islands in, in, in the state. So there's a real concerted effort to do the infrastructure upgrades that we need to get it uh, get esports going. And although we bring the cables here, we have to also worry about the terrestrial deployment of broadband. And you know, we only have really two competitors here, Hawaiian Telecom and Spectrum. And to be honest, I think they're a little slow and very expensive. So mm -hmm. I would like to push them to provide faster and cheaper or invite a third competitor to uh, compel them to do something differently. But we have to improve the infrastructure and also improve the outcomes as well as lower the costs for our future of uh, esports domination. So is that in the works then to improve the infrastructure? Yep, 
So DBED and uh, Bert Lum at the broadband office is actually chasing, I don't want to say the figure because it's confidential, but he's chasing some federal monies uh, that would dramatically improve our capacity here if he gets that grant later this, this month or next. Okay. And how long would it take, um, to your knowledge, to make those improvements um, so that we can improve our um, speed? Generally, the rule of thumb is for a cable landing site, the permitting, if it goes well, is at least a two-year process. Mm -hmm. That's in the best case scenario. To answer your question more honestly, I think it'll be at, at least, after we get the grant, at least another three years before we actually start plugging and playing with uh, broadband capacity increases. Okay. And so, um, Senator, are you on particular committees in the legislature that work, look at these issues, including esports? Yes. So unfortunately, we don't have an esports committee. Maybe we will in the future if this turns into a dynamite area. Uh, but I sit uh, on the technology committee and I chair the Energy, Economic Development and Tourism Committee in the state. Uh, so this is kind of in my wheelhouse. If we're going to have any discussions about esports uh, from an athletic standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, it will probably come through my committee. Okay. And have there been discussions in your committee on esports? No. So all of my discussions about esports have been directly with HHSAA, uh, with the stadium authority, because I have plans there, um, with the University of Hawaii, Sky over there. Um, you might know PC Gamers, Devin Woolery. I talked to them, but it's really, we haven't gotten to the point where we're really coming up with a policy and coming up with potential uh, bills for e gaming. For okay. e yeah, and Sky will be on my show in two weeks, and uh, we'll learn a lot more from him. Uh, but um, Senator, have so have any bills um, been introduced, or have you drafted any bills that have a direct relation to esports yet? Not uh, yet. So, like for example, I was talking earlier about how I'd like to see competitive high school uh, esports. In, in the future. And you really don't need to have a law to, to do that. Um, Chris Chun over at that organization, he just needs money to pay for you know infrastructure, pay the coaches and, and that sort of stuff. So I'm chasing money for with him or for him uh, to get that rolling. So a lot of the esports opportunities really don't need to take legislation. It's just a matter of is there a will, is there money behind it, and uh, is there infrastructure that can support it? Do you know whether the Department of Education um, is committed to adding esports in um, uh, up to grade 12? Yep. So um, the DOE right now, as well as ILH, the private schools, they have have it uh, comp competition on the club level. So DOE is fully embracing uh, esports. It's just a matter of how do we take it from a club level to an actual competitive high school level. That's the tricky part that we're going to have to solve in the next year or two. Well, you know, when we're looking at tourism, um, one thing with esports is the potential for having uh, conventions and conferences and uh, bringing um, tourists in for um, esports activities, events, games, those kind of things. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think the potential is, is huge. In fact, I was working with Devin as well as Sky just about a month ago. We put in a bid for Hawaii for the Street Fighter Championships in February. Uh, we're competing with the Bahamas and, uh, I'm sorry, some other Caribbean island. But apparently the owners of, uh, I can't remember, the owners of this Street Fighter game, uh, they want to do it kind of on an island. So we put in a, a bid. But to, to your point, I look at esports not purely from the entertainment value, but from the economic development angle. And to your point, event planning, those are jobs that can be brought here that we don't embrace uh, at, at the moment. And you look at just the, the technology behind esports, the coding, everything from the, uh, the technology that goes into a console, all of that are potential job creators here. And we, we, we know that we are a one trick pony in this state. We have tourism and we also know that tourism doesn't pay the best wages. So if we're going to 
revisit tourism? How do we leverage the benefits of tourism to go and spawn off a diversified uh, economy? And I just think that esports uh, has the opportunity to help us diversify our economy. And one diversification element I would think would be with software development, game development, um, marketing and advertising and other kind of ancillary areas of esports. Because esports is not just the process of gaming, it also includes developing games. Um, yes. And also even in the movie industry, um, I think we'll see more and more movies that do have a uh, esports theme. Yep, I mean, we can gamify everything. Wasn't there one movie where the audience could pick one of three outcomes of, of the movie? I can't remember what the movie was, but I think in the movies of the future are not going to be you and I sitting there watching the Titanic go down for two hours. We're going to have options like, oh, can the Titanic rise? Or maybe half the people pass away, not you know, whatever, right? I mean, there's going to be an opportunity for us to interact with our uh, traditional uh, movies uh, and video formats uh, in the future. And I think that esports certainly dovetails into the ever-changing movie entertainment environment. And we are um, situated in a very unique place in terms of one of the hotbeds of esports, and that's Japan, South Korea, China. Um, do you think that uh, having such a close relationship with Japan has some potential impact on what we can do in Hawaii? Oh, most, I'm, yes, most certainly Japan. And let's not forget Korea. I think it's actually bigger in Korea than bigger, it is in, yeah. in, in Japan. And I'm looking at some of the gaming numbers. And I mentioned there's 2.7 billion people on the planet that uh, participate in e-gaming. And out of the 2.7, 1.5 billion are actually from Asia. The next biggest swath is uh, Europe, and then it's Latin America, and then it's actually North America is the smallest 7% of that figure. So if we're going to grow that 7% into a much larger number in the future, and we know that this, this arena is dominated by Asia, you're exactly right. We sit at the center point of where all the action sh could and should be taking uh, place. So uh, that's, that's another uh, plus for, for us in terms of our location. Oftentimes in Hawaii, we talk about our location, the most isolated landmass on earth as a detriment. And I want to get past that and look at how is that to our uh, uh, positive uh, benefit, right? We, we forget this idea of always cry, making cry baby and talking about the price of paradise. Let's look at profits in paradise. Mm -hmm. If we take that mindset, we figure out like where are, how is our strategic location to our advantage? And let's go chase those business opportunities. We have such a tradition in Hawaii for having big events, big sporting events, and those include the Great Aloha Run, the Honolulu Marathon, of course, has been going on for many years and attracts many, many visitors, including um, uh, thousands from Japan. And we have uh, uh, Sony Open, we have uh, golf events, we've also had the Pro Bowl here. Um, do you think that esports can be among those very popular Hawaii um, events? Yes, most definitely. Uh, Hawaii has a pot of money, I think about $6 million a year we have set aside for uh, luring sporting events. So some of the uh, events that you just mentioned, for example, golf, we spend about $2.2 .2 million a year on golf. Uh, last year, when the Dallas Cowboys and the LA Rams played here, uh, we, we gave the Rams $2 million. The Clippers come here, or used to come here, for their preseason training. Um, we pay them $600,000 a year. So there is a pot of money there to uh, entice uh, sporting e events here. One thing that you did mention was the Honolulu Marathon. That I love that, that uh, particular event because, as you mentioned, it draws in a lot of people, but they ask the state for absolutely nothing. There is no subsidy whatsoever for the Hawaii uh, Honolulu Marathon. And if we go down the road of trying to get esports tournaments here, I'd like to, of, of course, try to get them because of our illustrious background, great workforce, and wonderful broadband uh, first rather than getting into this practice of having to put money out there for any kind of event coming here. But to your point, I think it has great potential to be a crowd pleaser as well as economic driver. And another thing about esports is that um, the people that participate in esports and gaming, they don't have to be 
six foot 11. They don't have to uh, uh, weigh 300 pounds and be a, you know, a linebacker or something. Um, it can be women, men, boys and girls of all ages and all um, ethnicities, all body types. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on that inclusion? Yeah, I, I think that's why you see the numbers and the participation that you see it at 2.7 billion people who are enthusiastic about it. Because, I mean, if you ever met me, I am no giant. I'm actually on the tinier side. There's no way I would be making a career off of playing sports. But as long as you got to 10 of these, two of these, and a brain in between your ears, uh, anybody can be an esports uh Phenom. So you're absolutely right. And also age, right? Um, there, in, in the NFL, you're lucky if you have a five to seven year career. That's a long time. But with esports, I mean, whether you're a 14 year old kid, these things functioning, uh, you can still be pro prolific at, uh, at esports. So I think there's many pluses as to why esports has the audience that it today. You know, and it's interesting because with the pandemic, we've seen a lot of an increased number of professional athletes who are investing in esports, and we've had a significant amount of um, traditional sports that have gone the esports route, like NASCAR. And you can actually turn on the TV and watch an esports competition where where you'd have to watch it all on Twitch or YouTube or Facebook or something before. Um, do you feel that, um, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I, I think that you look at how the traditional sports can't be, really be played these days, right? Or if you're gonna play a football game or a soccer game, there's no audience there, just like at your home. So why not shift that game from a, feel into your, your home. I mean, you look at before eSports really took off, I used to play Madden, right? I, I can't play football, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and in this environment, you're not gonna have the opportunity to go and, and, and even practice football at Kapiolani Park, but everybody can play uh, Madden's football game on, on their console. So you're right, whether it's football, baseball, your, your traditional sports, I think are going to see dwindling numbers that even before COVID, you saw that attendance at baseball, basketball, and football games are slowly di diminishing. And uh, maybe that came at the price of the more of, of an interest in esports. So yes, I think that the, the landscape of the entire sports entertainment environment is definitely shifting. And that shift does impact our state universities revenue uh, in terms of ticket sales and and so doesn't it make more sense for UH to consider um, having esports tournaments and including that uh, as part of their athletics department? Yes, I, I agree. And Sky is leading the charge for the University of Hawaii and considering he has almost no budget and is putting his motley crew together there, right? He doesn't recruit people. He doesn't give scholarships to uh, student athletes at the University of Hawaii. But he has done very well. I mean, I know from what I understand, University of uh, California Irvine is probably one of the premier esports universities on the planet, and Hawaii can go toe to toe with them, kind of like Hawaii going toe to toe with Alabama on the football field. I mean, he's taking all the juggernauts and really being competitive at the University of Hawaii. So the opportunities are there. He needs more in terms of facilities. He needs more uh, financial backing to really catapult himself into that upper echelon. Of uh, UC Irvine's uh, of the esports world. You know, way back when I was a young associate at uh, the firm Davis Reed and Richards, um, I worked on the Aloha Stadium litigation case and um, learned all about how it was made of core 10 steel. And ever since then, um, the Aloha Stadium has held a place in my heart. And it will be a, a very interesting day when it is demolished and and rebuilt. And um, tell us about your thoughts about the role of esports in the Aloha Stadium. Okay, let me give you a quick timeline as 
as to where we were and where we are today. Um, right now, we're in the RFP stage. We have six potential contractors. I think by the end of next month, uh, the state will whittle that down to three and offer those three potential contractors an RFP. Uh, they will put on their best show, tell us what they would like to do with the new stadium. And by perhaps next summer, we'll pick a contractor to be the one to reinvent that entire area. Uh, and we hope that construction will begin by uh, maybe this time next year. And by the end of 2023, or maybe the start of 2024, we're gonna have a new stadium there. Um, and considering that I, as we've been talking about, I'm a big fan of esports. You really can't put esports into an open air arena. So I'm having a discussion with the with potential contractors that may be adjacent to the football slash rugby slash uh, soccer stadium will have an esports arena that is multi-purpose though. Um, so if you can imagine, uh, every NFL football team has an indoor practice facility. So if you can imagine a hundred yard football field that's indoors, which will double in my hope is as an esports uh, arena. And we could do everything from esports to weddings, birthdays, whatever. We've got to make sure that that facility is constantly being utilized. Uh, but so that's kind of the discussion that I initiated with uh, the contractors that are not the contractors, but with the, 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 the contractor who is helping with the master planning of the future of, of uh, Aloha Stadium is to provide at least a, a thought that esports might have a footprint on that property. And, you know, there might be a, um, a silver lining in this delay of making these decisions regarding Aloha Stadium, because uh, even though esports has been around um, since 1972 and even before um, in competition, only in the last few years have people become more aware of it. I realize that there has been competitions, big competitions for big money for the past decade. decade and more, but it seems that people are becoming more aware lately. And so if, if Aloha Stadium had been rebuilt um, without the thought of eSports, it seems to me that it's a bit of a disaster. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're thinking that eSports, you have design implications to bring eSports in. Yep. So I mean, this, the stadium itself is just going to be a small portion of the entire 100 acres at Aloha Stadium. We're going to have a, another, uh, maybe the stadium will take about 16 or 20 acres. We're going to have another 80 acres for us to do all kinds of good, cool, mixed-use ideas. And so esports is one of those cool ideas that we're putting forward. Well, Senator, I'm going to give you the last word and uh, maybe get, uh, tell us... Uh, your vision for esports in Hawaii? I think the potential is phenomenal here. But as with any kind of change in trajectory in Hawaii, it's going to take a lot of support. So I'm glad we have a forum like, like this to, to talk about it because it can't just be Catherine and Glenn talking about it and Tyler and Sky and a couple of others. I mean, the, the dozen of us have to turn into a hundred, have to turn into a thousand, have to turn into a lot of people because the, the things that we talked about, everything from competitive high school sports to actually build out of an arena, all of that costs a lot of money. And all of that will only be achieved if the community rallies behind this entire push for embracing esports. So I'm on board, you're on board. We just got to get more people to, to join us and see the full potential esports has for the future of Hawaii. Thank you, Senator. I'm excited to have you on board. And uh, thank, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be Alex Hutchie. We will talk about esports marketing. See you then. Aloha.